I'll give a very quick talk here because we're running behind. I'm going to show you how to successfully get cold fusion in aqueous solution. And it comes as a result of the Deuteron flux equation, which I find is key to understanding how to make active cold fusion systems, whether they're aqueous nickel, aqueous palladium, or co-deposition. And basically what I'll review today is I'll show the quasi-one-dimensional model of flow. From that, we were able to control loading. We were able to derive an alternate way to co-deposition from what Stan Spock did. It's interesting, two sets of different equations gave rise to the same mechanism of co-deposition. I'll briefly describe a catastroph catastrophic active media, optimal operating points, and we'll stop around metamaterials. Uh, you all know what flux is, so we can skip that. The quasi one dimensional model allows us to understand Deuteron flux either through the solution or through the metal. So when we consider Deuteron flux, uh, JD refers to a current of Deuterons through here. Uh, this is the uh, flow to the gas, this is the tiny flow that goes to fusion. Uh, JE is the amount that enters the metal. And then we found there may be another group that goes through the metal uh, and then comes out. And I'll show you that in a bit. And the reason I think this is important, is there anybody here who thinks the US government, the US government knows what it's doing in the economy? Raise your hand. <laughs> and, that's okay. and that's because none of you would deal with your home finances the way the government does. You know money's a zero-sum game, except for them where they can keep printing. So if you have a zero-sum game, oh, sorry about that. If you have a zero-sum game, if it's going up in a gas, it's not going to go into the metal. You understand? Cold fusion is not fusion by electrolysis. It is one minus electrolysis. If you get the bubbles coming out, you're not going to go into the metal because it's a zero-sum game, like you'd handle your own finances. So let's look at the, at the current of deuterons. There are two terms. One term comes from uh, the concentration gradient. Uh, this is the diffusivity of the deuterons, and this is the gradient. So you know that if you have a pile of deuterons, they separate out and go right down the gradient. And the other uh, term comes from the applied electric field, which is the, uh, the first derivative in space to the electric potential. And that's multiplied by the local con concentration of deuterons. And this is the electrophoretic mobility. So what we have is two terms that determine where the flow goes. Now, if we write the current and we put the terms in, uh, we now can control loading. And we know that controlling loading is important because we know that until we hit about 90% ratio of deuterons to palladium, we don't see excess heat. Now, the, the whole thing here is that JG, the amount that goes up in the gas, is an absolute loss. It cools the system, it loses the phonons, you lose your fuel, and in fact, you, you're doing exactly the opposite of what you want. Now, if we take the flow equation and we divide by the concentration of deuterium, we get the first order rate equation. And what this says is that the first order rate of entry of electron, uh, entry of deuterons to the metal. E is entering the metal, is equal to the electrophoretic mobility times the electric field, makes sense, minus what goes up in the gas, minus what fuses. Now this is on the order of zero, because even if we have full bore cold fusion, we're only burning up 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 13th deuterons per second, and that's essentially zero compared to Avogadro's number. Now the other thing we want to do is the Einstein relation is mu over d, is kt over q, we can substitute it, and then we get from this first order rate equation, this equation. We've substituted d over mu as kt over q, the Einstein relation, and we then get that the loading of the deuterons into the metal goes as the ratio of two energies. It's an ordering energy from the applied electric field and a disorder from kt, and then there's some geometric terms and the diffusivity. And this basically is what controls loading. Again, the important point here, if you remember every, anything about this talk, is our success in cold fusion in aqueous systems is that it is not cold fusion by electrolysis, but one minus electrolysis. See, there's the minus. Okay. Um, 
if you want successful fusion, you want to maximize this, minimize that. Um, and that is the take-home point. Let's talk about code deposition. The way we derived code deposition back in, this was uh, late March, early April 89, was now if we take these equations and take the ratio, we can write also a diffusion equation for palladium in solution. Palladium's a cation, it drifts at an applied electric field intensity to the cathode. So we have two similar equations and we can then determine what the local concentration is and when I did that I found if we did this we get a very high ratio immediately of uh, deuterium to palladium. Now what's interesting is if you plot this out, this is a theoretical curve where we're applying time here and this is the logarithm of the loading ratio, we see that conventional cold fusion loads very slowly and co-deposition you get very high levels, there's actually two types of co-deposition. Um, uh, Spay Wars and JWK like to uh, co-deposit onto metals other than palladium. I like to deposit onto palladium, the papers will explain why, but what we find out is we get higher energies here but it's a slower turn on, slightly slower than palladium onto other metals. And that's because if you're putting the deuterons onto the palladium, which is free of deuterons, it's going to drift in. So it's going to take a little longer to get the ratio up. Well, one other thing with co-deposition is that, uh, again, we see optimal operating points and they grow with time. So for example, in this uh, cold fusion result, which we presented back, I think this is uh, ICCF10, Here's our input power in watts from 0 to 12 watts. Here's our excess uh, incremental power gain over uh, what we apply. And we see that if we wanted to drive it, we would do it here. And interestingly enough, as the co-deposition continues, we see these grow with time. The other thing we do is now what we do as we, uh, when we occasionally co-deposit, we'll measure the excess energy that we create as a function of the deposition. So here, for example, uh, this, is cal sorry. this is calculated palladium atoms thickness added. I did it on the basis of the rate at which we're putting on the electric current. And here's our excess power gain. So here's our break even where this is what we would see with the Ohmic control. And as we start laying down more and more atoms, we end up going up to a power gain in excess of 200%. Uh, take home point is there are more than one type of co-deposition. It is co-deposition is a very good way of getting the excess heat quickly. In our experience, it's a low level excess heat and that's why we don't use it that often. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to skip this. Basically what we found back at ICCF4 was that on occasion, if you're going to have a paroxysmal heating of the palladium, you're going to get a massive desaturation. Where does it go? Well, it turns out that in uh, early palladium cigarette lighters, you would start a fire. Uh, you could actually load a uh, palladium, put it in your desk, and create enough of a thing you could set wood on fire if, if it was uh, loaded enough and developed a hot enough temperature. Well, what happens is, is uh, it drives off. This is the fractional saturation of deuterium in the palladium. If you have a paroxysmal rise, you're going to get a massive deloading. And where's that deuteron going to go? You have a volume. They're limited to six surfaces at the most. And sometimes some of us put boron or gold, and they can't get out that way. So they go to the vacancies. So what we think is happening is that on occasional times when the temperature goes up, those deuterons end up zooming to the, to the vacancies, thereby giving the desired reactions. Optimal operating point manifolds. This is the fourth thing that came out of the quasi one-dimensional model. And basically what we saw is that when we look at the excess power of either uh, palladium with heavy water or nickel with ordinary water or combinations of the above, uh, what we see is that when we plot as a function of input electrical power we see a rise in excess power and then a fall off. And we believe here we're having insufficient loading and we believe that here we're having wasteful electrolysis as I showed you from the equation. And therefore what we try to do is hit the peak performance which is right here at the optimal operating point. Uh, let's go to the next one. It turns out that, that many things have these optimal operating points whether you're making helium production 
from our cold fusion or if you were uh, trying to do some other materials. Uh, we find the optimal operating points work with the engines as well. When we end up driving Stirling engines, what we find is when we look at the power gain, uh, again, we see a peak and therefore we try to drive the engine right there. Take home points, these optimal operating points, by the way, uh, are the reason why a lot of people miss cold fusion, I think. I mean, if you set up a system to your power supply and you're driving here, you're not going to see anything. You're driving here, you're too far. So that's one of the reasons when you see us driving nanors and uh, fusors, the aqueous system, as I'll show you in a bit, we'll go through an exploration phase where we will put in different input power levels, we'll characterize the system, then we go to exploitation where we drive it for what we want. Um, let's jump ahead. Uh, here again, what we see is when we learn how to control the optimal operating points, we get a nice delta T over the control. Uh, here we see it in multiple regions. Here we're looking at input electrical power from 0 to 8 watts. And a delta T comes up here to ADC. We can boil off. Uh, in this case, it was heavy water. I wasn't very excited about boiling it off. Uh, we use low paramedic paramagnetic ion heavy water, which runs about $3,000 a liter. So I have no interest in, in boiling it off. When you know your optimal operating points, you can do things like this. Uh, here is our heavy water. This is uh, platinum is the anode, heavy water, palladium is the cathode, and it's control, fusor, control, fusor, control, fusor at increasing levels. Here we have a match. So we're looking at energy to the right with these curves. We're looking at power to the left from these curves. So here our input and output match over the control. That's an ohmic control. Here we're getting more out than we put in. We check the control again. It's a good match. Here it's a, we're, we're not capturing all the heat here. But in each case, we get more out than we put in for the cold fusion device, and we get a match for the control. Metamaterials. Um, the, what is a fusor? A fusor is a wound cathode opposite a anode, and what we do different from everybody else is we have a very high impedance solution. So my solutions, when I run these, are as much as 800,000 ohms. And I don't think there's anybody who's even close to a fraction of that when they do cold fusion, because they salt. They'll put in lithium, they'll put in sodium, they'll put in potassium. We find our finest work comes with ultra pure water, removing the paramagnetic ions, and with an arrangement that I'm about to show you, which is uh, the metamaterial setup. Now, what do we mean by metamaterials? Uh, uh, let me show you one thing. Uh, when we did the coil, we tried a number of techniques. This was back from about 1989 to 93. And when we did the fuser, I couldn't believe it. We were getting bigger gain in every way we tested it than all the others. And what happens with the fuser, for example, here's a rolled cathode, and the anode would be over here, the electric field would be in this direction, and the most amazing thing is in a high impedance, non-salty uh, solution, you get bubbles on one side. You have very low throwing power. So for example, when I showed this at ICCF10, uh, Mike Recubri didn't believe me. I said, we get bubbling on one side before I showed the video. He said, no, you don't. And we showed the video, and in fact, it's only when we see the bubbling on one side we get the excess heat. And we'll, we'll show you more about it. This is a metamaterial shape. What we mean by metamaterial is we used to characterize materials by their properties, but it turns out the shape affects the properties. And metamaterials are a way that we have found, we, all people have found, of changing the properties of materials by changing their shapes. And when it's done, for example, in optics, it creates components that defy expectations. Negative refractive index, negative phase group velocity, electromagnet. And we'll hear more about that from Nathan Cohen in a bit, I suggest. Now, when I tried to publish this, there is one person in the field who has prevented me from publishing it. I won't discuss his name. But four <coughs> journals I sent this to. Uh, most of them had three reviewers, two reviewers said publish, and the third reviewer said, no, metamaterials don't exist by my book. <laughs> okay, E-field. What we found out is that in our systems, we don't usually go below 220 kilo ohms for the solution. 
Uh, what we find out is when we analyze the electric field, what we were doing was very different from Fleischmann and Pons. In most cases in cold fusion, what you do is you put two wires in, more or less. Sometimes you have, in, in, in Fleischmann's initial one, he had the anode going around as a, co as a coil around the outside. When you do two wires here, so here, they're into the paper, we're looking in, and what happens here is all of the electric fields are coming into one point. There's no net flow through the metal. I think that's another reason most people fail. Because when we do the fuse or and analyze where the electric field goes, what we find out is it's actually quite different. And it turns out there's a lot of movement through the metal. So what we see is the field goes into the metal, then it goes through the metal and then out. And I think that's what's happening. We are creating not only a high loading, but the flux through the metal by creating the metamaterial shape. And so that may be the reason that we only saw maximal excess heat with fuses and why we always use the fuser configuration for aqueous systems. Um, here's another thing. Uh, in this experiment, we added salt to the solution. And we lost this bubbly. We lost the excess heat. And as we showed in the, uh, the MIT course, in a whole series of photographs, and, and eventually we're going to do a, uh, an, a, an advanced uh, course in this. What we see is gouts of bubbles. In the, you lose the ability to get the flow through the metal if you salt the solution. Take home message, metamaterials are real, not only in optics, but I believe in cold fusion. The fusor refers to the shape that gives the movement of deuterons through the metal when it's placed in a high impedance solution. Otherwise, it doesn't work. OK, um, when we ended up being able to control optimal operating points and able to control the loading by the techniques I just showed you, we were then able to control heat after death and turn it on when we wanted. In this system, for example, we have two cells in electrical series. Uh, we use an OMA control in our cold fusion cell. We use another OMA control in the secondary cell, which has used to calibrate the calorimeter so we're using the OMA control to calibrate the cold fusion component. We use a second calorimeter to calibrate the first calorimeter. And so, for example, here we get a nice match. Now, one of the things Louis Smullen taught me was that it's really important to try and get this in the middle of these two. I don't always succeed, maybe about a third of the time. But here you do see a match in the controls. Here's the input to the fusor. Here's the output and energy to the fusor. Here's the input and power to the fuser, the output, and you can see the OMA controls are a good match. When you're able to build a system like this and then quantitatively get the outputs of excess energy, incremental power, and excess energy here, see we can measure the heat after death that occurs after the system shuts off. Here's the, the uh, heat after death is power, which we call tardive power. We, heat after death is an energy. And we like to talk in terms of power, so we call tardive thermal power. And when we do the time integral, we get the heat after death. What are the temperature units there? Uh, these, these are power units. What we often do, I find the biggest thing that helps us is that we use thermal power spectroscopy. So we take the thermometer. Everybody does thermometry. But for me, it's like looking at the, the surface of water and trying to guess what fish are underneath. If I take the calibration, and do it, then I get all this other information. I get the incremental power as a function of time. I can rule out the false positives, and I can't do that with thermometry. Is time in minutes? Uh, it's time is in minutes, okay. yes, uh, as is this one. So here, for example, here's our noise in our system before we start. Here's a nice, Louis Smalling would have liked this, because here we have the uh, OMA control smack dab in the middle. Here's the input to the fusor in energy. Here's the output. Here's our incremental input, incremental output of power right off this axis. And we can see when we turn it off, we get some heat after death as power, and then finally it comes down to the noise level. And with a calibrated system, we can measure all this in, in, the, in the land of the blind. It's, uh, we, we keep seeing things that we keep discovering because we can see from thermal power spectroscopy. I really recommend this. Dump, you, you can start with thermography but really convert it to this because you'd be able to see a lot more. Um, this was our first use once we were able to control
uh, heat after death. We did it a number of ways I'll show you. Uh, here, for example, uh, the OMA control is outside in between. It's not as good as it is. But what we did here is we took the heat after death and used it to heat up another volume of water. So we're actually doing work here. This was our first use of heat after death for work. And then finally, it drops back to the noise level. Uh, we can skip this. It turns out there are many ways to control heat after death. And it's only because we had thermal power spectroscopy we could see how to do it. I mean, if you're able to, to accurately measure all of these things, then you know what the impact of your tweaking is. Otherwise, you don't. Um, okay. Uh, the other th thing that's interesting, you've heard a lot about uh, photo irradiation of cathodes. And here's one example. Here you see the cathode, the anode's over here. Boy, you can even read the ohmic control from the carbon composition resistor. And here we have the laser irradiant on the cathode. Uh, this is about 3 milliwatts, and yet we produced a 40 to 50 milliwatt increase in the output. So here we're looking at the power in watts. This is our input power uh, without the laser, with the laser. Here's our energies off on the side, and we do two controls. Now we have to do a control and a control with the laser. And what's interesting here is that we only found a photo effect when we were irradiating at the top of the optimal operating point. If we were on the sides, we didn't see the effect. Uh, we can skip this. All right, that's it. Right, any questions? <laughs> yes. I had a question. The position of the optimal point, uh, is it always the same, or does it move from experiment to experiment? Um, it not only moves, <laughs> it not only moves occasionally side to side. But it moves up as I showed you with co-deposition. It moves up as the materials change. If you were to have virgin palladium before what we think the vacancies drift in after loading, you won't find a, a high optimal. You may find nothing initially and then slowly it rises. It turns out another thing that changes the position is if you're using it in an application. What we find is that when we couple to a motor Often it'll change. Peter. See, your results with the laser, your protocol is a little bit different than uh, Dennis's. So, for example, in um, Lenz's experiment, if he turns the current up or he turns the temperature up, he'll be able to get excess heat at a certain level. So, what he likes to do is to dial down the electrochemical current or the temperature to get down to threshold or right around threshold. And then when the laser comes in, or well, later on when the two lasers would come in, then it would kick it up so you get an enhancement of the effect. So in your case, you've already got some excess heat. And then you turn on the laser, you get an uh, increment uh, over the excess heat. Uh, there's other different. Also, our analysis of what's going on is different. I mean, if you really want to talk about it, I don't think the optical radiation gets in very far into the metal because of skin depth. So I don't know how much of it gets in. What I do find is that there's a reflection from the surface into the solution, and that impacts the loading. What we find out is that to transfer from the solution to the metal, you have to have an intermolecular deuteron transfer. It takes an asymmetric infrared vibration and a microwave rotation, and that's what I think the, the laser does. But Peter's probably right. Dennis was measuring the amount of light absorbed. So calorimetry was sufficiently sensitive that we were able to see a 15 milliwatt uh, absorption of the two laser beams. Any other questions? Yes. Have you done or do you plan to do fusels with gas phase? We could do that. I hadn't thought about it. I liked it. One of the things that amazes me about these meetings, as well as the IAP course, is how many great ideas have come out. But I hadn't thought of that. But we could do it. Anything else? Okay. The n